My name is Amy Greenwald, and I am computer science professor at Brown University. And I have the honor of introducing our first keynote speaker during lunch, Eric Horvitz. Eric is the director of Microsoft's main research lab in Redmond. He is unique among computer scientists in that in addition to a PhD, he has also obtained an MD from Stanford. His thesis work and his follow-on work in the early 90s were a driving force responsible for a revolution and ultimately a revitalization of the field of AI, prompting the transition from primarily logic-based reasoning to probabilistic reasoning under uncertainty. He has been elected a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the Association for Computing Machinery, the Computer Scientist Professional Society. In 2015, he was named a recipient of two of the most prestigious AI awards, the Feigenbaum Prize for Sustained and High Impact Contributions to the Field of AI, and the Alan Newell Award for career contributions that have breadth in computer science and bridge the gap with other disciplines. Horvitz is passionate about harnessing the latest developments in computing technology to do good for the world. And we will hear about some examples of how he is doing this now. Thanks, Amy. Well, <clears throat> it's a, a pleasure to be here today. It, it's been a fabulous morning. I've enjoyed the the talks and panels. So AI is the study of, of the computational mechanisms underlying thought and intelligent behavior. And there are other definitions and descriptions in the first paragraph of the, of the proposal where the phrase artificial intelligence was first used in 1955. The founders pointed out that one of the goals was to find how to make machines solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans. And that often comes up. Uh, in reflections about what it is we're trying to do. And it's a nice definition. Um, the founders also pointed out in, a, in, a, in this beautiful document uh, the foundations of, of, of AI, of machine intelligence, talking about perception, learning, reasoning. And they had a special uh, place in the document for talking about natural language, how critical this was for human beings and, and intelligence. And over the years, we've seen multiple subdisciplines evolve and whole research communities that have multiplied and expanded well beyond the purple squares I have here, sitting on top of those four basic pillars. And as we've all been feeling, there has been an inflection point, and there have been several inflection points over the last several decades. The most recent one over 15 to 17 years, I would say, is based in the explosion from the point of view of my grad school days in the computational resources that are available now, even in our pockets. The, how inexpensive memory is. We can almost store data for free when I paid half of my fellowship at Stanford to buy a 40 megabyte hard drive that failed shortly after I, I purchase. Uh, data is, is copiously available now via this digital economy we're in uh, through devices, the web being so central in human discourse. And learning and reasoning prowess has kept up. We've had a, a, a few, uh, uh, I'd say even breakthroughs in this space. Certainly a, lot, a bunch of insights. And of course, with opportunities comes an interesting competitive landscape that's almost self-sustaining and fueling among industry, academics, uh, government agencies that fund these kinds of things as well. But it's important to point out that, that uh, there's been long-term sustained R&D that's been going on all this time. In fact, we, hear that we heard about AI winter earlier. I find that the AI winter people refer to as one of the most productive times in AI history. And the innovations coming out of this research have been shared and continue to be shared all along. In the late 90s, mid to late 90s, the, a, a team at SUNY Buffalo um, really started working on this dream of automatically looking at letters, handwritten letters addressed in the wild. Could we actually detect them and save hundreds of millions of dollars, which indeed they, they, they sowed the spark of doing back then. And now as we speak, the 25 billion letters per year are being scanned in machines at the US Postal Service. And we know how much that's saving in terms of efficiency and dollars. Now, there were some breakthroughs. Uh, um, and it's not just uh, convolutional neural networks and deep learning, but in several aspects of learning, hierarchical learning systems, uh, different kinds of ways of inducing structure and abstraction. 
Um, the, the, the advent of deep learning about nine years ago, uh, which um, maybe seven years ago at Microsoft Research in a summer experiment when Jeff Hinton and his students came over and, and for the first time uh, applied these neural networks, which had been designed and tested uh, in, the, in the late 80s to copious amounts of acoustical data associated with speech found that we can actually see a, a big bump down in word error recognition rates. And this is explicitly led to thresholds being reached. We can now do things like, which are societally relevant, real-time speech language to language translation, for example, now filled in Skype. Or many of us have dashboards like this now where our cars are almost driving themselves. Uh, Semi-autonomous, for example, this is the Tesla display here, where, where it, per, per report, CNNs are being used, or neural networks, to actually track roads. And there are things still, you know, developments still in the laboratory that I'm very excited about. I used to tell my researchers on, on, on our teams, if you, you get the thumb and forefinger into computational systems, we can build civilizations. Uh, and, and just recently, our, our Cambridge lab uh, designed systems that can really track the graceful, subtle pose of hands. These aren't videos, these are models that are being, are tracking gesture. And this really depended on advances in machine learning and inference. New competencies and experiences that I especially am excited about tend to combine modalities. For example, hybrid learning pipelines using deep neural networks uh, in larger architectures that bring language together with, with visual recognition systems. Um, at Microsoft Research, um, a couple summers ago, we worked on systems uh, that could actually detect objects and actually learn from data about captions to understand how to interpret pictures. So what you see here in black is the machine guess as to what's going on in this picture. And in the purplish is what, the, what, a, what a human tag looks like. Man doing a skateboard trick, an open laptop computer sitting on top of a desk, the human maybe is a little bit more precise. Sometimes the machine gets it wrong, thinking that this is a fire hydrant, but human beings know about, more about the subtlety here. So that's a little bit of the background, and you saw some societally re relevant things there already. But there's a broad spectrum of opportunities when it comes to healthcare, the sciences, transportation, agriculture, sustainability and education, and a number of other areas, even privacy and security. We see all this data being sucked into these systems, and we we are, we are, we are um, concerned about privacy uh, and, and what that means and bias, but AI methods themselves can be applied to privacy. Uh, for example, figuring out which, what, what's the most important data for a service to apply a service and to assist a user of a computer um, and the most or least sensitive at the same time. So I want to talk about, when it comes to those 10 areas, uh, in, in a social good realm, and of course those are 10 of many, many more. Um, typically I like to think about the prospects with a data to, precision, to predictions to decisions pipeline. We have perce perceived or sensed data that's recorded somewhere or encoded. We use machine learning to build models and very often we see uh, projects stop here. We can make predictions and they're harnessed in a variety of ways. But the, where the rubber meets the road is decision making. And this is a kind of a, a, a golden pipeline of data to predictions to decisions. And once we set this kind of a framework up, we can go the other way too and apply uh, methods developed in computer science to compute the value of additional information. What do we need to learn more? What would help now? This idea of active sensing and active learning, which is so critical. And I make this seem like a one-shot flow, but it's a sequential problem. And we heard today about Markov decision processes and partially observable MDPs and how this is kind of a skeleton to a broader, deep problem. And I want to say that it's not about automation necessarily or, or policy that you turn a crank and pops out a door, but about people, models, and insights for explanations, understandings. And so we always want to consider both the the, the psychology and the technology that enable people to be in the loop, to understand how to, for example, change parameters of a decision model and what it means to manipulate um, outputs and inputs and see what the sensitivities are to get a better feel for causation, for example. And I thought that today I would uh, just dwell a bit on AI and healthcare as a template, more if we're thinking more broadly about the other areas, but also about healthcare for itself. It's a long-term dream 
to have computers assist with our health and wellness. Uh, AI and medicine has, a bona, has been a bona fide subfield of artificial intelligence for many, many years. So the, the, this administration uh, uh, highlighted, and Medicare services highlighted um, around 2008, the challenge of readmissions, patients being um, uh, discharged from hospitals, um, and then turning up within a month back in the hospital again. Uh, a, an article that came out in 2009, uh, looking at 2004 Medicare data, found that 20% of patients uh, under Medicare reimbursement were bouncing back within 30 days to the hospital, 35% in 90 days, and the estimated cost of what was billed to be avoidable readmissions was 17.5 billion of our taxpayer dollars. So at the same time, we started working with a hospital not very far from where we are right now, the Washington Hospital Center, part of the MedStar system. It's one of the top urban hospitals in the country. Um, they were ahead of their time in that they had been collecting fine-grained data for quite a while through the activities of, of some data evangelists in the hospital that had sort of a, a far look into the future as to possibilities. And it was quite fine-grained fine -grained diagnostic codes, vital signs, labs, medications. But I should say that this data set and others that came after framed a whole bunch of work, not just in readmissions, but in hospital-associated infections, uh, septicemia, uh, core advances in AI, uh, notions of, of applications of something called transfer learning, for example. How do you apply data from one hospital and use it in another? But when it came to readmissions, we ended up building a system after m building many kinds of models, some explanatory, some more discriminatory, uh, with, with less of, a, of, of a explanatory power. Uh, something called Readmissions Manager. And we actually put this out into the real world, both here at Washington Hospital Center and other hospitals throughout the world. And what, the way it worked was, it, uh, when, when the patients were getting ready to be discharged, a physician could look and see what was the probability they would bounce back using many variables uh, to the hospital within 30 days. And hospitals throughout the country have used this, and they would actually even post and let us know how much money they were saving and how it was working with statistics. But we say we can go beyond phase one. We want to build decision models that are powered up by the probabilities, not just stop with the displaying probabilities that doctors could look at, for example, and say, well, what does this exactly mean? What do I do? Um, turns out to do this, you have to really dive into separate disease physiologies and process and go deep with teams. For example, congestive heart failure. 10% of people over 65 in this country, nearly 10%, are grappling with congestive heart failure. It's a $35 billion a year management uh, uh, cost goes along with that, with managing CHF. Um, often a revolving door situation because these, these patients uh, tend to get overloaded with fluid, they get off their meds, or they, they just, they weren't right to begin with, or they take in, they have a salty meal, and they tip over and they come into the emergency room, uh, usually for a two week, ten, seven, eight days to two week tune up, as it's called. And it's also a very dangerous thing. So what did look at a decision model that would capture what would be the, the value of a special program if you can identify high risk patients and you could selectively take some of your limited dollars and apply it in the right place. And built a deep simulation system that would take a holdout set that wasn't used in training and use this to, to drive a simulation as to what would happen if, for example, I had an intervention Let's say it's an education program for patients or, or seek following them up with, a, with an outpatient visit that cost $800 with, effic with an efficacy of 35% reduction in readmissions. And the model would let you read off the savings um, to understand the savings. And so you'd know, okay, well, if I can find this and it really does have these parameters, I will reduce, run, if, I, if, I, if I dip this predictive model in the hospital and follow the policy that it tells me, that this decision model tells me, I will have a 30 one and a half percent readmissions reduction rate and a 13.2 percent reduction in dollars. Now, why is it not the same? Well, it turns out that you're spending money on the false positives. You always have a false positive rate of some level, and we have to sort of manage that with these systems. What about a, someone says, I have an $1,800 uh, package. This will keep patients out of the hospital, 20 percent efficacy rate. You know right away, you shouldn't, the simulator tells you, don't even try it. With, it, you will not be able to, to save dollars, you'll just lose money on this. Now, think about this. The AI systems we're building with the right kind of simulation or layer of reflection can tell us their value. 
We know, for example, given what we could do to do interventions in a hospital on the x-axis per month dollar amounts and efficacies on the y-axis, that upper left-hand upper left-hand corner, everybody gets this treatment. It's inexpensive and it's e efficacious. Lower right, it's expensive. It doesn't work that well. No one gets it. Our systems can prove that to us. But what AI systems do is they give us this new wedge of value and we can compute that wedge of value in the context of the actual complicated hospital ecosystem we're working with. And this applies in so many other areas. To understand this, to build insights about where the AI is generating value, the AI policies and real-time decision making as opposed to fixed policies. Here's another um, uh, challenge area that I think a lot about, preventable errors in deaths. The Institute of Medicine in 2000 said that there were up to 100,000 avoidable deaths based in errors uh, in hospitals. In 2013, uh, studies showed this is probably more like uh, 440,000, kind of like a city the size of Oakland or Miami going away quietly every year due to avoidable deaths. Third leading cause is believed of death in the United States. A study just last May, um, last month I should say, uh, confirmed this finding. I'll put this up in big pink here. I'm expanding their own figure. So avoidable deaths in hospitals are believed to be right behind cancer and heart disease. Well, what's the promise of AI systems in this department, in this realm? I often think about this whole challenge area as putting up safety nets as we construct bridges, for example. This is a safety net under the Golden Gate Bridge. Can we do this? And what's the promise here? And several pieces of work show us interesting directions. Uh, a group at Pittsburgh, Greg Cooper's group, uh, and working with, with Hasgrecht and others, showed how you can, in an unsupervised way, in a cardiac unit, learn to recognize anomalies. You learn to recognize acts of omission and commission and flag them as low probability events and transitions between therapies and actions and tests. A few years ago, we started playing with the idea of, can we take surprising outcomes? Patient came to the emergency room, uh, expert physician thought it was X, they were discharged, and they're back three days later with a primary diagnosis that was nowhere in the chart. Wow, that's interesting. That's an interesting anomaly. How did that happen? Well, even experts can be characterized in how their minds work, and we can characterize the world of complex physiology in terms of what hides in the cognition, cognitive shadows of human experts, and build machine-learned models that say, hey, oh, hang on a second. There's a significant likelihood you will be surprised by this patient's diagnosis in 48 hours. Take another look. Now, medicine is also another interesting place for perception and robotics and reasoning research um, as even a test bed for how machines and humans might work in the physical world together someday. Um, I, I love this work uh, at Johns Hopkins by Carol Riley and others where, where we're trying to recognize a grammar of surgery. These are human surgeons and uh, the, the, the student and team here are trying to figure out a way to recognize, for example, a, an insertion, a left transfer, a loosening, and so on. And this kind of, of ability has been applied in a number of robotics uh, 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 collaborative settings where robots work with people. I say this again last month at Sheikh Zayed Institute here in Washington, D.C. This fabulous paper and video came out in Science Translational Medicine showing a robot, which is that, that, that thicker little pipe there, working with human surgeons hand in hand, collaboratively on a complicated procedure called an anastomosis repair. This is not a real one, it's a demonstration here, um, but it's the kind of repair that happens if you have to have your intestine repaired. And in this case, what's going on, what's being shown here is the power of these methods to do really fine-grained, regularized stitching, for example, using infrared, uh, um, illumination and machine vision, as well as a model of hand-in-hand -hand work with physicians. I'll just pick up a couple more areas that really are exciting to me. Sciences, it creates a huge area for, for machine intelligence and learning. Um, several years ago, Daphne Kohler's team at Stanford showed you can take the Morse code of data coming off of these expression chips. And with the latest work in, in learning and inference about, of abstraction, 
of these pro of, of, of uh, probabilistic relational models, as they're called, simplify, cut through the complexity of biology, and identify that there were kind of eight modules operating here of different classes, for example. Just two years ago, at Microsoft Research, working with Cambridge University, um, an AI theorem prover was used to identify the what was believed to be a very, and probably is, a very complicated communication protocol that biology uses to signal cells to go from embryonic stem cells into a differentiated cell. But I'm amazed that they discovered, hey, this can be controlled with three inputs. This kind of result, which would not have been uh, um, identifiable by humans, has deep implications for us being able to start someday control a, a, a buggy program, one called cancer. And how do we keep up with the literature? There's the whole issue of, of, of the explosion of knowledge. Just in biomedicine alone, there are about a million papers a year. As we have been speaking here, two papers a minute have been going into PubMed. What do we do about it? Well, Hoi Fung Poon and team have used unsupervised learning and distant supervised learning um, to understand how to take the way people write science papers and figure out how to recognize entities and relationships and build webs of influence automatically, quietly, while we sit here as papers fly into the, across the transom. And you can actually automatically add this knowledge to large meshes of how, for example, protein, proteins interact with proteins and so on. And even based on those representations, build tools that can be used in discovery for example, um, in this case, showing how two drugs, combination drug therapies might hit the right variables in this biological mesh to turn off a cancer or slow it. Agriculture, I had the fortune of visiting um, recently Vulcan Isler's group at University of Minnesota, but other teams even at Microsoft Research are working on this idea of precision agriculture, and the USDA is very excited about this area. Um, NSF funds this as well. Um, in one project, they're actually linking together sort of information and policies about how drones fly over fields with how ground-based robotics move. To try to explore things like nitrogen levels, uh, moisture, uh, infestations. It turns out that these two systems are quite symbiotic. Um, the drones can give us gross uh, pattern views of what's going on in the field, including row structure. Uh, but in the end, uh, using concepts of value of information, what needs to go where, which asset goes where to fill in the story, the bigger picture, we can build a nitrogen um, a map of the, of the field, for example. And in, in, a, in, a, in a video that would make uh, Johnny Appleseed, we'll put a smile on his face, had he seen it today, uh, as drones fly past orchards, um, uh, his team has shown how we can count apples, and it's just it's an example of keeping track of things uh, um, while doing other, other, other tasks on, on, on a farm. St. Peter, we heard a little about this morning. It's a very uh, powerful, uh, you know, a very, very promising area to, su to support with these methods that we've been developing in AI, uh, models of perception, um, uh, predictions and decisions in support of our world's ecosystems. I've, I've been very excited about the expedition in computing. We see from NSF SICE. Um, the Department of the Interior has several programs. I, I was fortunate to speak to some people collecting large amounts of data that are, have yet to be analyzed. Um, and USGS has been, of course, involved as well in this area. I'll, I'll mention one project that's close to home, hits close to home, the South Puget Sound area. Um, uh, this was a team at ETH working with NC uh, North Carolina, uh, North Carolina State University, USGS, and the United States um, Fish and Wildlife Service to figure out how to build systems that could help us. We had to buy, sort of buy reserves and plan to try to do our best as development proceeded in this growing uh, in popularity Puget Sound region. How do we protect the streaked horn lark, the Taylor's checker spot, and the Mazama pocket gopher? And in this work, um, the idea is to really think about to model the uncertainties, not just now, but in the future, about what animals will do, as well as what land might become available or become unavailable over time, to build what's called a dynamic Bayesian network that walks through over time, uh, that informs a sequential step plan, even from, uh, 
this team has built a, and uh, provides us with a, a, a system that can be, that, that experts, planners can interact with. And in the end, did evaluations to show what they expect the value of their system to be in um, the persistence of species in a region. Just one example of many. Now I have to just pause for a second before I move off of sustainability to mention that a year and a half ago, um, we had a special meeting uh, hosted by Edward O. Wilson um, on the promise of computational systems, including decision making, machine learning, planning, and sustainability. And he summarized the meeting with this statement. AI, AI may be essential to the survival of life on our planet. Now you can take that as optimistic or a pessimistic statement. I'm not sure how I want to take this. <laughs> But I checked in with him recently. I said, I might mention this publicly. He said, please let people know how I feel. <laughs> so I wanted to end by talking about opportunities for all of us, untapped opportunities, in harnessing data that's already there. And in some ways, data has accrued faster than we've been able to look for it. Uh, and infrastructure for, for you know, existing sensory and perceptual infrastructure. Here's one example I'll mention, and that's weather. So NOAA, which provides our country with weather services, including winds that, the, that all the commercial air transport companies use, launches balloons, as they have for many years, from the set of sites you see here at Black Triangles. And it's called the Winds Aloft Program. We recognized a few years ago we said, wait a minute, there are thousands of wind sensors in the air now. This is what our country looks like, sort of, right now, as far as the planes ab above us. I think I just heard one just now, actually. <laughs> um, it's not an easy problem because we have ground-based radar. And by the way, I, I just think I'll have to put a, put a plug in here. Our team reached out to, to, to Tom Khalil at OSTP, which which made it easier for us to get access to FAA data feeds, but they're available to researchers in general. And it turns out we have to sort of reflect about lots of missing variables, but when you have two planes with missing variables heading into the same wind in different directions, well, you get the idea. So we built a system called Windflow. It's available right now as a, I have to pause here, a cloud service. Um, um, you can, you can bring up, you can bring up the, the NOAA map, the wind flow map, and look at differences. In our paper on this topic, we explained how to get ground truth. We actually had some fun afternoons in eastern Washington flying balloons. And I'm going to tell you a little bit, a little bit about this while I have you enjoy a, 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 maybe a typically cloudy day in this, in this area um, as our balloon went up into the stratosphere. But the idea is we said, okay, listen, let's gonna, we're going to use the NOAA report and the wind flow report to predict where that balloon's going to land. And you see how much better the wind flow system did than NOAA. But of course, we could test this in other ways. And we recently began working with a carrier who was very excited about this data set. Um, they now have programmatic access to the, to the interface, uh, to, this, to the inferences. Um, and we're doing uh, not just... Um, analysis with ground truth from other sources, but also A-B compare, flight after flight, NOAA, wind flow, NOAA, wind flow, and so on, on the same day. What does this mean? Well, one of the hardest AI problems I've worked on to date, um, I'd capture as with the words precision planning for routing aircraft through dynamic wind fields. Because the idea here is that you want to think about sensing and where you put the plane or, or a fleet of planes to sense as you move and as you route. And it turns out, that here's the opportunity, the great circle path between two cities, which is typically taken by aircraft, is not the shortest path in, when it comes to time or CO2. We want to sail on the winds that are inferred precisely. And I'm going to end with an example here that, that um, I was very excited about. We did a few years ago. Just to give you a sense for possibilities here, using cell towers as sensors. So uh, in 2008, there was an earthquake in Africa. 
outside of um, Rwanda in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, uh, we ended up getting access to a large cell phone log, just incoming and outcoming calls, not just the counts on cell towers. 140 cell towers, we had three years of logs. And we looked around the earthquake time and uh, saw 10 million calls, and we noticed we could detect a disruption in people getting on the phone and talking about the earthquake. Well, we could build a model, how much did a cell tower outgoing calls increase, for example, and convert the existing infrastructure into a sensor array network and identify, even though it's outside the country, the epicenter of this earthquake, 17 kilometers away from the actual center point. But not just that, we can then build a model to infer sustained disruption over day one, day two, and so on, and you know, where we might need to help and provide assistance. Not just that, we can manage the uncertainty in our inferences and compute optimal plans as to where we do reconnaissance to collapse the uncertainty in an ideal way with cost benefit. So I want to summarize by saying I put up 10 areas here. I'm excited about all of them. I have, we have fabulous projects in Microsoft Research, but even a broader array of projects and areas being investigated by our, our close colleagues in academia and, and other industrial labs. There'll be rich benefits for people in society. And I was gonna end with a short clip to give you a sense for how we work. Uh, I mentioned before we, were, we, had, we built hybrid pipelines that could convert or transform and represent language uh, and visual data to automatically caption imagery. As we develop technologies, we often think about, wow, how could we apply this even in a prototype? What would it mean? Let's find out more. And in, in, in the case with the image captioning pipeline, um, inspirational leader in the space, Meg Mitchell uh, at Microsoft Research, who was working on the original work, uh, teamed up with Anna Roy Cool, who has a, a sight impaired family member, uh, Saqib Sheikh, who also is, is a sight impaired employee at Microsoft, and working with our cognitive systems team, Xiao Dong and Kenneth, put together a system very quickly, that shows a direction. I'm going to just show you, and we'll have, uh, just, we'll end with, uh, so I keep talking a bit about his experience with the system here. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the pivot head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk, and there's no response, and you think, is everyone listening really well, or are they half asleep? And you never know. I see two faces. 40-year-old man with a beard looking surprised. 20-year-old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu, and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. And then it'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Hi. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do. But artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate. And I'm really excited to see where we can take hey. this. As engineers, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far off dream and building it one step at a time. So I'll end with a view from the stratosphere looking down at the beautiful Earth. Thanks very much. <laughs>